Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Gilligan, and I'm the director of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. We're thrilled to host this very special event today, and I'd like to welcome you to the Hoover Institution's Washington office, the, J the Johnson Center. I would also like to recognize Senator Dick Luger, who's joining us today. Welcome, Dick. So glad you could join us. And I also want to welcome you, and thank you for coming out and joining us today. Our discussion today is titled, Innovation in U.S. Defense Policy, a Secretary of Des Defense Perspective. And it will take a deep dive look at how the U.S. has employed a technological advantage in defense of the nation, and whether that remains a feasible proposition. What was once the novel use of stealth technology, guided precision weapons, satellite command and control, is now being challenged by new technologies such as autonomous weapons, cyber, and advanced manufacturing. With an accelerating research and development process, will the U.S. be able to continue to rely upon technological dominance for its national defense? Moreover, what role does the private industry play in this future? The moderator for today's discussion knows both participants well. As the former Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times, Phil Taubman has had front row seats to some of the most consequential national security events of the last few decades. In 2008, when Phil retired from the New York Times, he came to Stanford where he is an adjunct professor with the Center for International Security and Cooperation. Phil also serves as the secretary of the Stanford Board of Trustees mm. and an associate vice president for university affairs. Thank you in advance, Phil, for what we'll, uh, I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. We are also delighted to have two incredible public servants as our speakers today. The Honorable William J. Perry has been at the front lines of U.S. national security for nearly half a century. Starting his career as one of the few analysts writing intelligence reports that reached President Kennedy as, and his advisors during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Bill eventually hit the pinnacle of government service when he was named the 19th U.S. Secretary of Defense. As Secretary, Perry led efforts to reduce the dangers of nuclear weapons in the post-Soviet era and secure a safe transition into a post-Cold War world. In 1997, President Clinton awarded Bill the Presidential Medal of Freedom. When he retired from a career in government, Bill took on another form of service, teaching and research. At Stanford, Bill is a senior fellow with the Hoover Institution and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. The Honorable Ashton Carter is the 25th and current U.S. Secretary of Defense, has the Chief Executive of the Department of Defense and Principal Defense Policy Advisor to the President. Secretary Carter is responsible for the men and women of the United States Armed Forces. Similar to Dr. Perry, Secretary Carter has devoted much of his professional life to public service and advancing science and technology in the defense of the United States. He has held a variety of positions in the Pentagon, including Deputy Secretary of Defense, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, and Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. Prior to his current role, Secretary Carter was the Annenberg Distinguished Vis Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Payne Lecturer at the Friedman Spogli Institute. Together, they have spent years in and out of the government focused on how they can promote and maintain peace and stability. When they were in academia, Bill at Stanford and Ash at Harvard, they co-directed the Preventative Defense Project, a program focused on how to prevent large-scale threats to international security from emerging, where they co-authored books, op-eds, and reports. Their collaboration has been successful because of their mutual admiration, respect, respect and friendship, and I'm sure you'll see that today. Here at Hoover, we are delighted that we have an opportunity to recognize this decades-long friendship and the benefits it has brought to our security. I'd like to give special thanks to Mike Frank and the Hoover Washington team who are about, and the Pentagon staff who are here, and Deborah Gordon, Robin Perry, and Lisa Perry for making today happen. Finally, a quick note before we begin, uh, both participants have an in advance chosen not to speak about current nuclear policy that is under consideration by the administration and will not be commenting on that subject. Further note, we have the secretary for about 30 minutes. His day job calls him elsewhere. Uh, and we're thanks for doing that, Ash. Thanks for fitness and we really thanks, appreciate Tom. it. But we'll, there'll be a bit of a, a, a change in the middle. And if everybody could just remain seated and we'll carry on with Secretary Perry at that point in time, we appreciate it. Phil, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. So, uh, of course, it's no accident that uh, these two gentlemen are here to discuss defense 
technology and innovation. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Bill Perry started his life as a mathematician, has a PhD in mathematics, and Ash uh, has a PhD in physics. Uh, and as I say, when you look back at the history of innovation in the Defense Department, you often find uh, scientists uh, serving in top civilian jobs as the catalyst for that kind of change. So let me just set the stage very briefly because we don't have much time with Secretary Carter. But I would remind you uh, that science and technology and defense are indivisible uh, in American history. And if you pick up the story with World War II, you have Vannevar Bush uh, working as the head of the Office of Science Research uh, and Development. Uh, of course, there was the Manhattan Project during World War II, which was staffed by uh, many eminent scientists. Then if you come to what I would think of as the first sort of uh, explosive uh, period of technological innovation uh, in the post-war period during the Eisenhower administration, uh, you have the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, the nuclear navy under Admiral Rickover, uh, and the uh, development of the first reconnaissance satellites. Uh, then if you uh, jump ahead, I think that the, the next big period of technological innovation really began in the Carter administration, uh, and largely uh, thanks to Bill Perry and Harold Brown, who was, of course, Secretary of Defense and, uh, by the way, also uh, <coughs> a physicist. Uh, and in that period, we saw the beginning of the developmental efforts uh, that led to the GPS system, that led to stealth aircraft, uh, and precision munitions. Uh, so the subject for today really is what uh, I think people are now referring to as the third offset. The prior offset, so-called offsets, were done to uh, give the United States an advantage in technology where we lacked uh, some of the manpower uh, to uh, face the Soviet threat and the Warsaw Pact. So here we are today. You have launched a lot of very interesting initiatives in the offset, third offset. And I think we're headed, at least from what I read, uh, to uh, more semi-autonomous weapons, maybe some fully autonomous weapon systems. You're working with uh, Silicon Valley. So when you... Uh, think about what the goals are for what you would like to achieve with this, what would the top two or three be? Well, the, the, the goal for me is the same as it was for Bill and Harold and, 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 and all of my predecessors, which is to make sure that we remain the finest fighting force in the world. Uh, we're that today, and for two reasons, I should say. One is because we have wonderful people, and that matters, a whole different subject. Uh, also, one where innovation matters. But uh, uh, the other is technology. And um, what we're doing today to try to stay the best is in technical substantive terms, Phil, as you said, keeping up with the times. So you mentioned cyber, you mentioned autonomy, you might have mentioned bio. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, um, because I think that's the revolution that will come after the information revolution, in a sense, and we need to be there for that uh, as well. But there's, a, in addition to uh, the technical substance, and we're present across the entire waterfront, we always have been, we have always uh, will need to be, there's a stylistic change from the time when uh, Bill was doing this, and, and I, I was working for Bill, and even before then, I want to come back and tell a story about Bill <laughs> later. But, I mean, first of all, uh, I always tell people, we don't build anything in the Pentagon. We buy things, first and foremost, and we buy them from private industry. So the key is our relationship with the private technology sector. The alternative was tried by the Soviet Union, which is do it all in-house. Didn't work out very well. So it has always been our relationship with, the, with private industry that has been the w channel through which we got uh, the best technology. Now, that has to be different in today's world, and that's what I'm trying to adjust to than it was in the world where I began and where, uh, where a Bill was. Uh, in those days, 
the technology of consequence in our world mostly was American. And much of it government sponsored. Those two things are still, we're still major players, but the, the, that, that, those two things are not to be taken for granted anymore. So we have to have a new relationship with the dynamic, innovative culture of the United States from the one we had when I started my career. And uh, so there's a technological, there's a, a change in the technical substance we're trying to achieve, but there's also an essential change in style. That's when you see me coming out all the time to uh, the Palo Alto area and elsewhere around the country trying to connect to the innovative community. It's in recognition of the fact that they, unlike I, young scientists and engineers, I, 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 it was part of my DNA growing up that you had a responsibility and a connection to public life. That's just not part, there's nothing wrong with people. It's just that that's not a reflex anymore. We have to reach out especially hard to connect with them, draw them in. So I think one of the things you're doing, uh, some of you may know, it's uh, Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, D-I-U-X. Uh, 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 the Defense Department has set up these units in Silicon Valley, Boston, and Austin. You're planning one elsewhere? Sure. We're going to keep going because there are lots of good technology right. hubs in the United States, and it's a great thing. You know, it is a cyber world, and we can all talk to each other over Skype and so forth, but, but animal proximity matters. Right. And having somebody in the neighborhood who is from us and of us and reaching out and trying to meet people on their physical <clears throat> and really uh, mental territory matters. And so I'm grateful to uh, Stanford, which uh, was an important part of helping me set up uh, DIUX down at, down at Ames, then up in Boston, uh, which has a somewhat different technological um, center of gravity from the Valley, and that's good. And then just last week, out in Austin, vibrant, vibrant mm -hmm. technological community. And people who, the, 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 you know, if you talk to somebody who hasn't been part of this and you give them a chance, these, these are young people who want to make a difference. And they want to have what's up here. They're just like all the people, the Hoover, younger Hoover scholars, same thing, same as you. They want what's up here to make a contribution. When you tell them they can do that in the field of national security and that that'll be really meaningful and you'll make it possible for them to do it. Maybe they don't have to join the military, although that would be great if they did, but we'll find some other way to make it possible for them to go in and out, do it for a time, then go off and do something else, broaden themselves in some other way and recognize that kids are different from kids in my day, and kids in Bill's day. And uh, we have to adapt if we're gonna draw them into our mission. Right, so uh, I think if, if one is a student of the defense acquisition world, uh, and I spent a fair amount of my time as a journalist writing about it, uh, it's a very slow moving process, quite cumbersome, bureaucratic, uh, and what you seem to be trying to do is create an alternative universe uh, in defense acquisition, agile, accelerated, buying things uh, off the shelf, in effect, in places like Silicon Valley or getting in, uh, involved early on in the development of technologies that you think may have military applications. Uh, so this is not such an easy thing to do, uh, on one hand, to accomplish that, and on the other hand, uh, don't you face a lot of resistance uh, in the traditional uh, consolidated defense industry about this, and in fact, in the military services themselves? No, well, the last part's easy, no. And the reason is that they, if let's take, take industry, are, 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 are great companies that have worked for us for a long time. Um, they're in the same situation as high-tech companies that I just described the Department of Defense itself being in, namely, uh, needing young, good talent, uh, needing to draw people into them to the importance of what they do. And um, so there's complementarity. Every time I get someone to 
work on one of our problems, that's someone potentially who's going to work for them. It is, in many cases, it's a small company that they will buy. And so, so this becomes a feeder for the traditional defense industry, mm -hmm. uh, which I, you know, I, I was on, ac under Secretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, so the, the, essentially the job that Bill had for Harold uh, when Harold was Secretary of uh, Defense, and he knows it extremely well, and it was a different era, but in this respect it was the same. Um, there are things that take 10 years. Uh, you know, you're going to build a d design and build a brand new ship class or something that's going to take a little time. What you can't afford to do in today's world is make everything take that long because, you, I mean, just look around you. The world of technology is changing too fast. You'll fall behind and people won't want to work with you because they're not going to work with people who fall fall behind. So it's, it's, it's a double whammy. Uh, if you can't be agile, so we do. We we need we need to do that, and we're we the wars, oddly, wars not a good thing, uh, but it's a spur to agility, because you can't you can't stand to not be there on time with something for somebody who's who's who isn't just getting ready to, for some hypothetical fight. They're actually fighting today, and. Uh, so we learned a lot about agility during that, that uh, period, and I, I myself learned a lot, uh, a lot about it. Uh, so our acquisition system, believe me, I'm, not the, I'm the last one who's going to tell you oh, everything's perfect there, but the companies are in the same boat we are. Uh, and, and, and the same boat, basically everybody in our system, every major institution, which is they're trying to get p young people, especially young, talented, up-to-date people in their environs. and working on the problems that matter to them. I mean, look around you, just about everybody here in this whole town and this whole country is doing the same thing, competing for the faces you see around this room that are bright, that have a future, that are up to date. We got to do the same if we're going to stay the best military. So let's take a concrete case, uh, which is North Korea. Uh, so we've got... Uh, <coughs> Not of agility. No. Uh, it's Jackie. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, the, the uh, missile defense system that the Pentagon has been working on for many years is, uh, shall we say, not uh, perfect. Uh, and so my question is, uh, when you think about what you're trying to do with DIUX and other acquisition, what do you imagine would be uh, outcomes that would be applicable to the North Korean threat? Well, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, North Korea is, just to be deadly serious about it uh, for a moment, and, 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 and Bill Perry is someone who himself tried very hard to um, get, on a different, get us on a different path with North Korea, but it wasn't to be. And they are what they are, and it's, it's, it's not a game. Uh, and it's not in the headlines a lot and so forth, but we, every day, um, the, the, the slogan of U.S. Forces Korea, as you, many of you probably know, is fight tonight. Not because that's what we want to do, but because that's what we have to be able to do. And we are ready to do. So we have a very strong presence there. Our South Korean allies get stronger every day. That's not the rock army that it was once upon a time. They're extremely good. We have a strong ally in Japan. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, the diplomatic picture is bleak at the moment. Um, and uh, we continue to be open to an improvement in that and try to get Russia and China and others interested down that road, but it's hard to project that that's where it's going. And therefore, for me, as far into the future as I can see, we need to stand strong in deterrence. Now, you mentioned missile defenses as well, and I'm going to differ with you just a little bit, uh, because we do try to stay ahead of the North Korean missile threat. You're right, missile defense is a difficult mission. And when it comes to a, a major nuclear threat like that posed by Russia, we know and have long known we have no way to protect ourselves except deterrence. But we don't accept that with respect to North Korea, and we're not going to. 
uh, for as long as we can possibly avoid it. And so we do aspire to protection uh, of ourselves, and we invest a lot. We try to stay ahead of what they're doing numerically and also qualitatively. But it's, uh, I mean, we've got North Korea, we've got Iran, if you're talking about problematic situations, Russia, the Gen Asia Pacific generally, and then of course ISIL, which we're, we need to destroy. Uh, so we've got plenty to do uh, today, but uh, North Korea is one of these things that just never seems to uh, go away. I worked on it once once upon a time, 1994, I think, Bill, I at least spent half of my time as an Assistant Secretary of Defense working for Bill Perry on 19, 1994, and it was deadly serious uh, back in those days. Can I tell you a Bill Perry story that I, I just got to get <laughs> out of here before I need Please. to go? Be, be, because, uh, and it's really aimed at some of the Hoover people here who are trying to figure out where to go with their lives and whether to continue to, to do what you know, Bill's done what I do as secretary, uh, and but more importantly, our you know, 2.8 million folks do, which I think is the noblest kind of way to spend your lives that you can have, which is protecting our people and trying to make a better world. There's just nothing better to go home and tell your family you've been doing all day than that. And so trying to lure them in. And I, this little story, Bill Bill wouldn't know this. He, I may have told you this story before, but you didn't know at the time. Uh, I was a physicist, totally absorbed with physics, no idea of anything else to do except physics, physics, physics. And I went to a, a scientific conference, and it was here in Washington. And I came, and there were sessions and sessions and sessions about uh, physics and uh, elementary particle physics, which was my field. And there was one sort of physics and the public interest kind of panel, or not panel, speaker. And I go there, and I just lark, and I didn't have, you know, that hour was free, and I sat down, and there was a, 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 a person from the Defense Department, turned out to be Bill Perry, I realized later, uh, years later probably, and he uh, was being essentially badgered by the audience about smart weapons. And the, 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 the question that they thought was a gotcha question to Bill was, you know, what are you going to do when one of these complicated, you know, microchip-enabled things breaks? You, and I, I'll never forget the phrase, and by the way, sergeants today would be furious at hearing this, is like, you know, how's some sergeant going to fix that chip? And Bill said, well, they're, they're, it looks and he said, they're not going to fix it. They're going to throw it out and get another one. <laughs> it's going to be that cheap. And I remember, and the whole audience went. <laughs> and, and I remember, and I said to myself, I said, now that, that's an interesting answer. And there's an interesting guy. He's a smart guy and a technical guy. Look what he's doing. <laughs> Look what he's doing. And, it, and, and a little light went off that later down the road, when I got kind of lured into this, as many of you, I hope, will be, by that offer, you know, just do it for one year. <laughs> Here we are 38 years later or something like that. Uh, and uh, there was a little spark in there, and I said, wow, that guy's something else. And you probably, you, I'm sure you don't remember that. Maybe you gave that speech uh, a million times, but for one young person in the audience, that said, wow, connecting mission and understanding, pretty, pretty cool, and it stuck in my mind. So when one thinks about autonomous weapons, uh, fully autonomous weapons, uh, uh, even semi-autonomous weapons like drones that we're using today. Uh, of course, it raises, uh, you know, possible uh, visions of the future where uh, we have uh, nuclear-tipped missiles aboard unmanned submarines uh, controlled by machines. Um, is that something you can imagine? Well, I uh, believe that in the matter of the use of lethal force, there will always be, at least speaking of the United States, a human being involved in decision making. I think that's necessary. Uh, and I, I don't anticipate that not happening. Uh, uh, systems that are, you, uh, uh, have greater and greater degrees of ability to carry out certain functions for themselves are growing increasingly autonomous. I, I mean, in most cases, you really need to continue to think of a human-machine overall system. 
uh, even though the machine gets more complex. So how, how but but and, and just interestingly, it, before all this discussion started, uh, I issued a directive. This is sort of eerie because I, not only was I undersecretary, but I was deputy secretary of defense too, as was Bill. Uh, but as deputy secretary four years ago, I, a, a, a directive which says exactly that, that there will always be, there always needs to be a human being in a, the decision making involving the use of lethal force by the United States uh, military. So, you know, when we think of technology today, we also uh, are finding the downside of technology and the loss of privacy, particularly. So as you launch these programs, uh, w what are you doing, if anything, to try to uh, also launch consideration of the legal, political, and perhaps even moral questions that will be raised by new defense technologies? Well, I just gave you an example of, of, of a, a, us trying to look ahead. This was now four years ago. Mm -hmm when we're talking about autonomous systems and people. And so we do, we do uh, uh, look ahead and, and think ahead in so far as privacy is concerned, and particularly internet privacy. The, uh, w one thing I would say to you is that we are e enormous consumers of information protection technology uh, because there's noth nothing more important to us. That is our principal cyber mission. Uh, that is what I tell our cyber people, both in cyber command and around the services. That's job one, because all of our stuff today, there's no point in having all those planes and tanks and ships and uh, everything else. They're all connected today, and so we have to have our network protected. So we are big supporters of and big sponsors of network protection, the largest in the world by far in terms of what we invest and the level of protection we demand. Because, you know, I think we see uh, almost uh, weekly stories of uh, supposedly impervious systems that are hacked. Sure. Uh, and it, it raises a specter of a future in which defense uh, operates so heavily through these systems uh, that they are vulnerable to hacking. Bill often talks about a miscalculation and uh, possibly having a nuclear war uh, you know, aren't we going to potentially leave ourselves in a situation where uh, some of these systems can be taken over by foreign powers or terrorist organizations? Well, we, uh, not in the case of the nuclear arsenal, it's kind of a, a special case where we have special uh, safeguards that I, I do have confidence in for other reasons. Uh, not to be gone into here, but uh, in general, you're right. We worry about it. Uh, we're concerned about it. Those uh, the, any, anybody who thinks they're invulnerable is kidding themselves. So for us, that means it's a constant battle. We're constantly looking. I'll give you an example in a minute. And but you also have to be thinking: What if I lose that connection or I lose that ability? So we train our people to what we call it operating through an attack of that kind. So you have a full back, fallback operational mode and style that is not complete prostration uh, if that happens. On the protecting ourselves front, I just want to mention one of the things that I've done that is, that is an innovation, which I'm always looking at, suggested to me by people outside. And one of the things I, I do is try to talk to people who are not part of our world, but care mm -hmm. about their safety and their family's safety and their children's safety, and, and uh, who will take an interest in a little time. I set up an innovation board. Eric Schmidt of right. Google Alphabet fame is the chairman of this. Got Jeff Bezos and, and Reid Hoffman. It looks at some personnel things that we do. Um, and w what I've said to them is I don't expect you to know anything about defense. That's not the point. But you do know what uh, agile, forward-looking companies and people are thinking. Tell me some things that might, might be valuable, might be useful. We can't use everything. 
because we're not a company, we're the public sector. But And one of the ideas that I got early on, and this is the kind of thing I've asked Eric and the board to provide me more of, is it turns out nobody in the United States government, the entire United States government, had ever done what is called a bug bounty, which a lot of companies do. And what a bug bounty is, is when you go out and you invite white hat hackers to have at your, and then report for a reward of some kind, vulnerabilities they find. And nobody in the entire government, we did it for the, and it's called Hack the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And it was spectacular. We got for free a friendly, very thorough examination of our <laughs> attack surface from which we were able to make hundreds of adjustments. And the kind of thing that you can pay for, but you pay a lot for it, and it wouldn't necessarily be as good. And um, we, uh, in our case, you know, we can't give big rewards or anything. People's, their reward was having hacked the Pentagon, because that's a pretty cool thing to do. It's not by itself as all right. So we got lots of people who did this for us. Now, there's an example of something that isn't uh, novel out in the rest of the world, but that we, for some reason, our people had never mm. thought of before. That's the kind of idea I want to get. And as I said, I can't do I can't do everything because we're the profession mm. of arms. Mm. So there'll be things that companies do and that we'll never be, be able to do, um, and it's not appropriate for us to do. But there are lots of things that we can do. That's a part of adapting our style as well as our technological content to today and the future, even as Bill did so brilliantly uh, back um, in the Carter administration. Okay, I think we have exhausted the, the time that you can spend with us. Uh, so. Well, you get to be with Bill, the rest. I'm afraid I, 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 I have to go do something else and I, I appreciate it. I, I, I want to repeat the what I said about Bill. Bill, Bill Perry was, if I, if, as I think about myself now talking to audiences and trying to draw people in, I was at the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference in San Francisco last week, and I'm looking at all these faces, and um, a, probably a great majority of them, not all of them, but had not served in the military. This isn't like the World War II generation or the draft generation or, or, or anything like that. And you look out on those faces and you say, how can I connect to them? and inspire them with the greatness of doing something in public life. And, uh, and I, I'll just say that, you know, a lot of, uh, that Bill Perry was a very big inspiration to me, many other people, many other people in my generation, but certainly uh, to me. Uh, he not only uh, represented that connection of uh, thinking and understanding to service, uh, but also great civility and decency. And that matters a lot. He was someone I always knew would do the right thing, stand for the right thing, stand behind people. And I think that's important too, that we all be um, uh, you know, morally solid for the next generation to our, the best of our possible abilities. And, and he, he was. So he had all that. And uh, uh, Hoover's very lucky to, to, uh, to have him. And I, I think our country and our world are lucky to have him. Bill. Thanks, Ash. Good to see you all. Yes. Mm. I feel like we're in a relay race. And yes. I just yeah. the baton. Right. Right. So, uh, I I, my apologies for not bringing you into the no, first no, part no, of no, the conversation, hear, but uh, time with the sitting defense secretary is uh, precious. So, Bill, uh, what you, you know, knowing what you know about uh, innovation in the military, knowing what you know about what Ash is trying to do, uh, what would be your advice to him? What should he avoid? Uh, and what should he be on the lookout for that is going to surprise him and perhaps uh, upend some of his plans? Let me start off with a point you already discussed briefly with him. We've talked about how important autonomous systems are today as compared with 
20, 30 years ago. Um, I don't really call them autonomous. I think of them as remotely controlled, remotely operated systems, particularly as Ash made the point, in the lethal field. In the lethal field, we don't have a doomsday machine. We don't give a machine the authority to decide to launch nuclear weapons. And to a certain extent, that applies lower down on the, on the lethality chain as well. So we have, we gain great improvements in effectiveness by going to machines that have an autonomous capability. But in almost all cases, certainly in all cases with nuclear weapons, we keep a human in the loop in the decision making. That's an important consideration. Uh, some of you here are old enough perhaps to have seen the movie where they had the doomsday machine. And the thing you have to always remember is not only do people err, but machines err. The best designed machines can err. And so we have people in the loop as well. When I've told you about and talked many times about the time I was awoken with a call from the North American Air Defense Command where the computer was showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. The point I want to make about that story now is that our computer was making an error, but our system understood the machines make errors sometimes, and therefore we required a human being to be in that loop. Luckily for the country, and luckily for all of us, the per human who was in the loop that night was a was an astute, thoughtful general who made the right decision not to send this, not to wake up the president at 3 o'clock in the morning, and that give him three minutes to decide whether they wanted to launch, start a nuclear war. <coughs> But so that, that's a very, very important point. You, you and Ash did bring it up, but I wanted, I wanted to reemphasize mm -hmm. that point. But what, what do you think the the uh, trap doors are for for Ash Carter as he moves ahead with this program, or his successor? Uh, since you've been down this road before with uh, new technologies, what are the things to uh, look out for that could turn into problems? He mentioned already one of them, which is that introducing state-of-the-art technologies and defense systems does require working with industry. We do not have state of the, we do not have the capability in the government to make state-of-the-art systems. We go to industry to get that done. And industry today is different from the industry when I was under Secretary of Defense and getting things developed. Um, people then understood the importance of assisting the Defense Department in what they were doing. And so when I was undersecretary, it was easy to go out to industry and get people to do things I was asking them to do. But it's not so easy for Ash. He is creating this, what is it, defense industrial something experimental. Yeah, thing. defense innovation unit experimental. Yeah. And one of the main points of that is to get industry on our side in doing these things. It's a tough job. He's, he's, work, he's working as hard as that as anybody could possibly work. And I think we'll have good results as a result of it. But it is very different. Uh, when I was the Undersecretary of Defense many, many years ago, this is in the 70s, 1970s, when we did the offset strategy, uh, more than 95 percent of, of military equipment that had electronics in it, the electronics were vacuum tubes. Hmm, right. Vacuum tubes. And it's hard to th think of that today. And so one of my jobs wasn't just to bring in these new concepts like smart weapons and stealth and so on, but simply get the American military equipment upgraded to modern electronics, to semiconductors, for the cost advantages, for the weight advantages, and for the reliability advantages. We had, uh, had an industry that was receptive, but we had the semiconductor industry here, which was on one side, and the defense industry. Mm -hmm. And they never talked with each other. So I created one program, which was called VISIC, Very High Speed Integrated Circuits. Nominally, the purpose was to advance to the next level of integrated circuit design for military equipment uh, to a, I forget what the dimension was, a micron, I guess, feature size, which was, whatever it was, it was about an order of magnitude higher than what existed before that. And so we put out money and invited com companies to bid on this. So we did get that. We, we got the program. We got the advance. But more important than the advance was I required that anybody that bid on this program, which is a very attractive program, anybody that bid on this program had to have a team. And on the team, there had to be one defense industry company and one semiconductor company, which is ordinarily not involved with this fancy. So it forced those two different kinds of companies to get together. 
And then the, the good that came out of that was far more important than the feature size reduction we got in hmm. the semiconductors. Hmm. So uh, Secretary Carter alluded. Excuse me. And that's what Ash is trying right, to do today right, with his DIUX. Right, right. So he, he, he alluded in his comments early on in this uh, appearance to the uh, Cold War uh, sort of balance of power with the Soviet Union. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was really a bipolar world in those days. And for anyone like me who spent any time in the Soviet Union, I was based there for over three years in the mid to late 1980s. It didn't take long uh, to see that the Soviet Union was uh, technologically backward. Uh, they may have uh, been a superpower militarily, but uh, technologically they were nowhere, they weren't even in the race with the United States in those days. Today, when you think about the things that Ash Carter is trying to do with artificial intelligence and uh, the kinds of startups that spring up in Silicon Valley, I think about other countries in the world, specifically China, uh, which is going to have probably as astute uh, uh, technological progress as the United States is going to have in areas like AI. So what is, when you think about this, how does that change the sort of stability issue when you're trying to develop the f American defense uh, of the future? Yeah, that's, that's a big difference today from when I right. was doing this. Right. Stealth. I remember I went after I got out of office at Defense, it was 1981, I made my first visit to the, to the Soviet Union. Prior to that, I got all these intelligence briefings about how the Soviets were 10 feet tall and so on. And the, what we were looking at in the missiles, they were damn good. The nuclear weapons, they were really good. So when I went there and actually went around and visited people, to, went to factories, talked, talked to the engineers, I finally concluded this is a third world country with a first world military system. Right. Even that was wrong. It wasn't the first world military system, it was first world missiles and nukes. Because we later learned out that the conventional weapons were pretty backward as well. I don't think that's true today. Right. Uh, I don't think Russia today compares technically with the United States. No country compares technically with the United States really today. And the technologies that really matter for our defense. But they're what I would call pure competitors mm -hmm. in China and pure competitors in some fields in Russia. So that's very different from when we, we did the offset strategy. We could, we, then we counted on the fact that we had maybe a 10, 15 year lead <clears throat> in uh, integrated circuits. And we exploited that to the, to the full. Uh, what's really different today is we, we don't have that lead anymore. We have a lead, but not a 10, 15 year lead. There are more of them out there. It's not just the Soviet Union. It's not a bipolar world anymore. So it, it really ch changes the situation in pretty dramatic ways. So interestingly, a historical footnote, Bill, of course, was the, the godfather, really, of stealth aircraft. But that technology uh, was based on theoretical work that had additionally been done, initially been done uh, in the Soviet Union uh, by a scientist. Yeah. And they were either unaware of the potential applications of that technology, or they simply didn't have the ability to translate it into stealth aircraft. So that's a kind of striking example in some yeah. ways. The Russian chief about. of staff in those days actually proposed to the Politburo a dramatic change in the military and what he called, if I remember the term, radio combat technical teams. Basically, is what we were proposing to do with the, with the uh, offset strategy, mm -hmm. although we didn't know what they were doing and they didn't know what we were doing, really. But that's what he was proposing, and he got turned down. They said, look, th their answer was, look, we have three times as many tanks and airplanes and guns as they mm -hmm. have. Who needs this funny technology stuff? We'll stick with what we've got. A huge mistake on their part, but they had the underlying scientific capability and very sophisticated scientists and engineers. They could have given us a run for the money then, mm -hmm. but they made a bad, a bad decision. One of the things people often point out to me is how wonderful autocratic governments are because they can make decisions like that. <laughs> Which is true, but sometimes the decisions they make like that are the wrong decisions. Right. Right. And there's no self-correction in the system anywhere. Once they make a bad decision, they just plow down that, in that direction for a decade or so. Before it, by that time, it's too late to make the, make the change. 
So, Bill, you, you, you live in the Bay Area. You know Silicon Valley. In fact, Bill, in many ways, was uh, one of the, I like to think of as one of the pioneers of Silicon Valley when he was working out there for Sylvania uh, back in the 1950s uh, doing defense contracts uh, on SIGINT systems. So when, when you think about what Ash Carter is trying to do, on one hand, the Pentagon is out there trying to do business with Silicon Valley through DIUX. On the other hand, uh, as we learned from the Edward Snowden disclosures, a lot of the biggest companies in the Valley felt as if they'd been violated by the Defense Department. Uh, after all, let's not forget the NSA is, a, is an agency within the Department of Defense. So how does he, how does he bridge this uh, kind of cultural suspicion of, uh, of the Defense Department? With great difficulty, because that's a very strong feeling among many of the high-tech companies in Silicon Valley, that the government is out to tell them what to do, is out to handicap what they're trying to, trying to do. It's preventing them from dealing with countries and companies that they want to deal with, and it's reading their mail. All of these things annoy people to a very great extent, and you don't have anything to balance that. You don't have the feeling on their part, yes, Maybe this is bad, but it's worth doing because of the dangers and threats we face. So he's having a hard time, I think, getting real support from these high-tech companies. If anybody can do it, though, he can. I mean, he's, he's really thrown himself into it. He's put the time and the energy. He applies what uh, Dave Packard originally called management by walking around. When he wanted to get something done, he, he doesn't just delegate somebody to go out and, and get it done. He actually went out. To, he'd been to Silicon Valley four times, meeting with the companies out there at the highest levels and the intermediate levels. And he set up the office to sit right in Silicon Valley to do this. So he's trying hard to overcome those barriers. But the barriers are very great. Right. So I have one more question, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, my question is looking ahead. Uh, to the next administration, whichever candidate ends up as president. Uh, when you started the uh, innovative programs you did during the Carter administration, uh, there was no guarantee that they were going to be carried through to completion uh, by your successors and future presidents. So what is, what's your advice? It, let's assume for a minute that what uh, Ash Carter is doing is smart, uh, that it's really uh, pivotal to the future defenses of the United States. What's your advice to not only his successor as defense secretary, but I think even more importantly to the next president and to the Congress, which after all uh, has to cut the check uh, to pay for these kinds of projects? That's a very good question. In, in the field of national security, there has to be some nonpartisan approach for success. That's particularly and obviously true in the field of trying to apply technology to defense systems but it's also to in, in even broader areas. When I left the Pentagon with its offset strategy reasonably well advanced, the developments really have been completed. We had the stealth airplane, for example. We had the first test flight. We'd done that in about three and a half years, which is some going. But it still wasn't fully operational. That was a year ahead of us yet. And so if the, if the Reagan administration had dropped that program, that would have been it. I was very much concerned about that, as well as some of the other programs we had going, which were not even pu publicly known at the time. So when the Reagan administration came in, they not only had not been supporting these programs, they didn't even know about good, a good many of them. So that was a substantial concern. In fact, they did just the opposite. They went to school on them, they learned what was going on, and they took the program from the development stage through production and into the field. So that by the time we got to Desert Storm, the F-117, the stealth airplane, the smart weapon, all of these things were their function. It made a tremendous difference in the outcome of that war. And I felt some sense of pride for that. But I also understood that if my successor, who in the first instance was Dick DeLauer, and his boss, ultimately the president, hadn't supported that, the whole thing would have, would have just gone down a heap of cards. So that's a very, very important point. And we have to hope what Ash is doing now will be sustained by his successor. There is no guarantee of that. And I would have, if you had asked me to bet in 1981 when I left office, is this really going to be carried forward to get the results we actually got of it in just five or six years? I would have said probably not. 
and luckily I was wrong because they did pick it up and they did follow it through. We can hope that this will happen with the incoming administration right. now. Okay, so uh, some questions from the audience, please. Uh, identify yourself, please, and keep the question brief, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. My name is Dan Grazier. I'm with the Project on Government Oversight. There's been a lot of focus today on science and technology, but uh, warfare is first and foremost an art form. And uh, we have the greatest technology in the world in the military. I was a tank officer in the Marine Corps. So I had uh, four tanks in Iraq in 2007. And, but even with all that great technology, we're 0 and 4, uh, zero wins and four losses in fourth generation warfare, even with all this great technology. So what's being done to make sure that we're not putting the cart before the horse with regards to technology and actual uh, operations uh, in, in the conduct of the art, uh, the art of warfare? So explain, forgive my ignorance, but we're 0 for 4 in, in exactly what? In fourth generation warfare, so okay. against uh, non-state actors, we uh, in Lebanon in 1983, Somalia in the early 90s, uh, and now in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it's very hard to say that we've been successful in any of those conflicts. And we've had all this great technology, but we still have not had any success. So what can we do to make sure that we're actually uh, creating the right, or the right technology to properly implement the art of war? Got it. Thank yeah. you. I think. Uh, I'm not sure we will do the right thing, but I think that's what Ash is trying to do with this program that he set up. I might give you one footnote that he did not mention while he was here, that when he was the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Acquisition Technology, as they call it, uh, we had a hot war going on in Afghanistan at that time. And we were getting requests from commanders in the field for various things they needed. One of the primary one was protection for, their, for the forward operating posts. And Ash, again, by management, by walking around, went out, not just to the headquarters of the deck, but out to the forward operating posts, talked to those commanders, became convinced that that was something that really needed done, and concluded the way to, the best way to give, resolve that problem was to get a high confident 24-hour day observation they could detect infiltrators coming from any direction at any time of the day or night. And he put up, he, uh, and that could be done best by a balloon, you know, <laughs> just an old-fashioned balloon up there with sensors on and the radio information back down to the ground. Now, in the ordinary course of things, that would have taken five to ten years to get that done, and he got it done in a few months. So it was a case that the system does not permit things like that to happen. The system does not prevent, permit us to bring a stealth airplane from concept to, to, to uh, first flight in three years. But people can do it. And uh, what I did in, 70, in the late 70s is what he did in Afghanistan. Instead of trying to reform or correct the system, we evade the system. You know, we set up a special case to say the rules don't apply in a special case and just push it through. <laughs> uh, it was easier to do in 77, 78 than it is now, but it, it's still possible to do it. You had to get some forbearance from Congress, which we got in that case, and he got in the case of the uh, observation post in, in Afghanistan. But generally, if you have a good idea and, it's, and you can sell it, uh, the importance of our troop welfare security to have it, you can get the support you need to get that done. But you have to be willing to take a chance. You have to be willing to go out and do something which, if it is wrong, if you make a mistake, you know who's going to be sick going to get, get ripped to pieces as a result. Mm -hmm. So you better be sure you're right when you, when you do these uh, out, out, outrageous things. So a very interesting example that's not really applicable directly to your question, but the development of the spy satellites, I wrote a book about this. Uh, no one knew more about the problems and deficiencies in the Pentagon acquisition system than Dwight Eisenhower. So when he became president and these new technological uh, innovations were being promoted by some scientists, he took them out of the acquisition system and gave them to the CIA, of all people. Uh, and so in the development of the first uh, photo reconnaissance satellite system, Corona, it was managed by Richard Bissell, uh, the director of operations at the CIA, who had zero technological background. Uh, but he knew how to get something accomplished. Uh, that was summed up best uh, in a little anecdote where he had a, 
Uh, one of his aides was riding with him in Washington, and they were racing off to get back out to the CIA. And he was driving wrong way down one, a one-way street, and she shouted at him, you know, Mr. Bissell, you're going wrong way down this street. And he said, I don't care. As long as there's no traffic coming, we'll get there faster. That's the way he ran the satellite program. Uh, so other, other questions? I was struck by uh, Ash Carter's statement here that information technology protection is job number one. It comes on the heels of Mike Hayden having said, Verizon does a better job of protecting information than the US government does. And I think he's accurate on that, because after all, the cloud system and everything shows we have this enormous amount yeah. of information that we depend on. The US government depends on Verizon and others to protect. Is there a disconnect here between the priority number one and the fact that there is not an effort by the government to accelerate U.S. government protection of information, to do a much better job at what Ash Carter just described as job number one? Yes, there is a disconnect. Um, one thing I will say, though, Jim, is that in some aspects of our protection, the ones which are most important, even supremely important to us, we are paying special attention to that connect. So when you consider the vast amount of data that are there, the vast amount of people in the Defense Department, uh, there are going to be plenty of them where we get a mediocre effort. But for example, in protecting our command and control link that directs our nuclear missiles to be fired, you know, it's a very, very important that in this, in some of these, we go to extraordinary lengths to protect them. We have, I think, technically, the best cyber capability in the world. I could be wrong on that, but I, I believe it. But we also have the most networks in the world and the most vulnerable in the world. So even though we apply this magnificent capability to all of them, we're not going to get, we're not going to get it right all much of the time. So here it's not just a question of having the best technology, but applying it to the problems that are by far the most important problems. And there are half a dozen of those problems which just absolutely have to have top, top priority in protection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Daryl Kimball with the Arms Control Association. I have a related question from Jim Hoagland. Um, as you know, uh, the Pentagon appears to be planning for how to use cyber attack capabilities uh, with respect to enemy uh, nuclear command and control. Um, as part of a, a new push for uh, what's being dubbed full-spectrum missile defense. Um, I mean, there are many who see this as uh, perhaps a useful approach. There are some who see this as possibly a, um, the, the other edge of the sword here. It could, could be a double-edged sword. Um, it could create destabilizing dynamics, um, not just with the U.S., but with other countries. What, what thoughts do you have about what considerations uh, our policy planners need to make, our decision makers need to make as the cyber uh, attack uh, and defense issue intersect with the nuclear command and yeah. control. Well, I said, said before, and I'll repeat it, I think we have the best cyber capability in the world, but a part of that cyber capability is an offensive cyber, that sometimes the way to deal with an attack from cyber is to attack back. Uh, in some cases, though, and for example, this command and control is an example, that doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> We have to be the very best at even the passive protection end of it. And that's probably where we are the weakest, I think. It's very, very hard. We have so many networks and so complex. And we have an intermixture of civilian and military in these networks. It's a very difficult problem. I mean, the Internet, after all, was designed to be open. And trying to fix that after the fact is, is an exceedingly difficult problem. At various times, people have considered building a parallel internet, specifically for maintaining security on, the, on, the, on links that are most sensitive and most important. For a variety of reasons, we've never done that and probably never will. But it's just a hugely difficult problem. Nobody should ever believe that we can, even if we're diligent, even if we're smart, even if we put all the effort in the world on it, everybody could, nobody should ever believe that we're going to fix this problem. 
we're always going to have a vulnerability to a cyber attack. We can minimize that. We have a way of responding back when that's appropriate. But it's always going to be there. So we need to be also prepared to live with, it, with, with that problem, to take that vulnerability into account in our, in our broader planning. So I think we are uh, at the witching hour. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming today. Appreciate it. And uh, Tom, thank you for hosting this event. And thank you, Bill, for, thank for you, being Bill, here. Thank you, Bill, for an excellent job of moderating. Thanks. It's, it's superlative. Thank you.